The Bible reading today comes from Paul's letter to the Philippians in the second chapter, beginning with the first verse. Therefore, if any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. May God add a blessing to this reading and the hearing and the understanding of this scripture. Well, there is a sobering truth for many Christians in our culture, and that is whether we identify ourselves as a conservative or a progressive, our deepest convictions often align more with our political beliefs than with actually being a Christian. In other words, for many, their political beliefs are more deeply seated and follow than their actual Christian beliefs. And this isn't surprising when we consider all the turmoil, the polarization and divide that we see. There's socioeconomic, racial, political divides in our world, our nation, our communities, and sometimes even within our own families. We are in a nation that has become divided against itself. Jesus actually warned against this when he said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. So how do we build a proper, healthy foundation as followers of Jesus? We turn things upside down. Or maybe it's better to say that we turn them right side up. And we make our deepest convictions come from our faith, not on our political preference. And we ground our convictions in love. When we do that, we will be a church that models Christ and bears light to the world. So we ask ourselves, why? Why should we even follow Jesus? Father Ken Saunders put it beautifully. I'm not a Christian because I want a reward of heaven. I'm not a Christian because I'm running from hell. I am a Christian because the character of Jesus Christ is so compelling to me that I want to spend my life chasing it, embodying it, and sharing it. And what is this character of Jesus Christ? It is the very thing that Paul shared with the Philippians in the lesson I just read a few moments ago. Have the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. When we do this, we mirror Christ to the community and the world. It's not just our nation that's struggling with division. It's true of Christianity today. Studies show that churches that are in conflict, that are suffering with inner turmoil, people sense that when they come there, and they don't want anything to do with it. There's enough conflict in the world and in people's lives that they certainly don't want to come to church and experience it too. But the goal here is not to be people that agree with everything with each other. And that's not what is meant by unity of spirit. You see, we are each unique, special, and created in God's own image. We each have our own specific life narratives and stories that have brought us to this place, the place that we are in our own lives. 
And that means that some of us are going to see the world very differently than each other. It means that we have to work. We have work to do if we're going to be a light to the world. If we're going to be a church that brings hope and life into people's life. The question here is how can we find unity in our diversity? How can we come together on the things that are most important? St. Augustine said, in all essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. And in all things, charity. Which also translates as love. How do we determine then what those essentials are? Michael Curry, Episcopal Bishop, in his book, Love is the Way, encourages listening to others. But also acknowledges that we're, we, individually, we're only one part of the greater good. And then our brothers and sisters, their stories matter just as much as ours. Bishop Curry shared a story where he was being attacked and being treated very poorly. He said, my only challenge is how to receive that anger and not give it back in return. Have you ever struggled with that? You get in the middle of a debate with someone and anger starts to flare. Do you have a hard time just responding in love? I shared this concept a few weeks ago. Bishop Curry said I needed to do something very difficult. To stand and kneel at the very same time. To stand firm in my conviction. Laying out what I believed and why. And when the response is anger... I need to learn to kneel before it. That is tough to do. I don't know about you, but when I get in those situations, I want to prove that I'm right. And I want to stand there and argue until they, the other person cries uncle and gives up. And then in self-righteousness, I proclaim myself the victor. But what have I really won? When we're facing someone who feels as strong as we do, Anger is not productive. In fact, it's actually counterproductive. We have to learn to create space for the other person. And this is the dance of peace and nonviolence. This is the dance of what it means to love as Jesus lived. Love is the way. One of the most important roles of the church is to be a safe place, a sanctuary, where we can actually disagree but where we've learned to respect and love each other as a sibling in Christ. It's not easy to do. But it's what Paul is talking about in this passage we read this morning from Philippians. It is to have the same mind as Christ. Doesn't mean we agree on everything. But the heart, the mind, and character of Christ is one of acceptance, inclusion, and of love. This is who Jesus was and continues to be today. Jesus brought people together despite their differences. Just look at the 12 disciples that Jesus called together to work with him. They were very different from each other. And at times, they disagreed. But there was one thing that united them. Jesus called them. And they followed him. I think the Holy Spirit within them gave them the sense that following Jesus was to be the deepest conviction of their life. It wasn't going to be based on whether they were conservative or progressive. But but were they walking in the way of love? Jesus is love on display in the world and in our lives. I ran across a quote by David W. Orr. and It said, the plain fact is that the planet does not need more successful people. But it desperately needs more peacemakers, healers, restorers, storytellers, and lovers of every kind. It needs people who live well in their places. It needs people of moral courage, willing to join the fight to make the world habitable and humane. And these qualities will have little to do with success as we've defined it. Our assignment is to live well in the place we reside. And to allow the Holy Spirit to do the same thing in us that it did for the disciples. To bring people of all various backgrounds together the way Jesus did. To share the love, the hope, the inclusion, and the promise of salvation that actually begins right here and now. And that is rooted in the one who loves each and every one of us as a beautiful child of God. The one who is cheering us on to come together in unity not necessarily in agreement on all things, but in unity that looks like love. 
So what does this actually look like? Will Williman, a retired preacher and bishop in the United Methodist Church, was lamenting what he saw as the almost inevitable split that was about to take place in his denomination over the human sexuality issue. Reflecting on how they had gotten to this point of disunity, he said, I wish that when we started the conversation in the church, we would have started not with the debate over human sexuality, but by all sides promising that we will stay together and then we will passionately debate and argue like Christians. What would it be like if we started any conversation around hot button or controversial issues by promising that we care for each other first and foremost and that we're in this together and that our greatest strength is our common love for God and by God and we will honor that in how we argue and treat each other. Realizing that through this kind of behavior, through listening to one another, we can find some common ground and a unity of spirit even when we don't have total agreement. It's about learning how to have respectful conversations. It's about learning how to listen deeply. Question for us. How do we listen to one another on areas that we actually disagree with? And there's so many of those controversial, hot topic that we find ourselves in disagreement with people around us. The racial issues, sexuality issues, religious issues, political issues. Asking non judgmentally, here's a great question to ask someone non judgmentally, but with a desire to truly understand the other person. What is the story or narrative of your life that's brought you to that conclusion? And then to listen, to seek to understand more than to be understood. We all have stories and history and baggage that bring us to where we are. But when we try to understand one another, we see the humanness in one another, and we're less likely to de demonize the other person. Ultimately, in the big picture, love prevails. John Wesley, the father of the Methodist movement, said, when we can't think alike, we can love alike. This is who we're called to be as Christians. When we do this, we both stand and kneel at the same time. We stand firm in our convictions, but we kneel with love and respect for our neighbor. We can pray for those who disagree with us, and we pray for ourselves so that we might understand them more fully. And we continue to seek points of intersection of commonality and unity because we're all God's children. Let love be our witness as it guides us in all our decisions how we serve, how we talk, and how we treat all people. The goal is to be a people who do the things that make for peace, who love, who seek to create a world where there is justice and mercy for all people, to be bold in our love, yet humble before God and others. So how do Jesus' words guide us towards that kind of love and justice? What would my life and your life look like if each day we sought to be driven by love and love alone. Each of us is invited to broaden God's kingdom by filling the world with the currency of love. Where there are people loving one another, God is then visible in the world. The whole law is summed up in that one word, love. Love always seeks the flourishing of every person and creature. In 1 John 4, 12, it says, No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and God's love is made complete in us. So what does love require of us? It means that we aspire to be a people and a church that live as if Jesus actually meant the things he said and that are recorded in the Bible. Jesus entered a world full of violence and division, a world driven by religious and political zealots who had lost their way. I'm convinced that we are in a critical moment in human history, in the history of our country, in the world. But we're also at a critical moment in the Christian community at large. It seems so much of our world and our lives are fragile and broken. Now, I am anything from a naysayer. I am far from it. 
and I'm not preaching a gospel of woe is me. At my core, I continue to be filled with hope and joy. To share that hope and joy with others means that I, we, must continue to train ourselves in love and ground ourselves in in peacemaking lives. In the days to come, we're going to need people who know how to be peacemakers because that's what it's going to take to choose love instead of fear that swirls around us. So what does love require of us? It means taking action. It means taking in teenage mothers. It means walking alongside families in poverty. It means creating support groups of people for people who've lost people to suicide, to people struggling with abortion, to people who are fighting addictions. It means welcoming refugees. It means getting involved in standing against the unprecedented rise in killings. Mother Teresa never shamed or condemned people. What she did was she provided for young people such love that they actually called her mother. Love is contagious. It's how we preach with our lives. In our modern world, much of our Christian faith has been driven by fear instead of love. So I want to leave you with this question in the form of an invitation from Jesus. What would our lives look like if each day of our life we were driven by love? And so here's the challenge for us this week. Bless someone you disagree with and bless someone you agree with. And pray for yourself, our church, and our nation that we will all have the courage to love. Amen. 